A very warm welcome to all our colleagues um, who are part of the Teaching Assistant Network Hub. Um, my name is James Bidolf. I'm the Executive Head Teacher at the University of Cambridge Primary School. And with me is Amy Durning, who's the Director of Inclusion, um, also a teaching assistant um, um, and uh, has recently be, been um, recognised for her work uh, nationally uh, in the Queen's Honours List. I'd like to uh, warmly welcome you, a, a colleague and friend from um, the other side of the pond, Professor Michael Giangreco, who um, works at the University of Vermont, and also um, a closer friend, uh, Dr. Rob Webster, who is now um, at the uh, University of Portsmouth, is the Director of Education Research, Innovation and Consultancy, um, a reader in education. And we are all very interested in, in the, the value and the, the importance of inclusion in schools, but also how teaching assistants um, contribute to the story about how we, we make everyone feel valued and welcomed and included in our schools. Um, before we do that, um, I just want, uh, Rob will explain to us a little bit about um, the work he's doing, and then we'll kick in with, with a few questions. Rob, over to you. Thank you, James. Um, Amy, first of all, let's get on record. Uh, congratulations for your MBE. That's mar really marvellous news and hugely deserved. So very well, very well done to you, very well done to the school as well. Thank you, Rob. Um, so uh, uh, we're going to discuss, I think, a, a, a journal and a particular paper that Michael wrote for a journal that uh, we put out last year. Um, so it was a special issue of the European Journal of Special Needs Education and way back in uh, April nine, uh, 2019, um, myself and Anke de Boer, who's a, a, an academic at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, uh, were invited to uh, co-edit a special issue of, of, of the journal on the topic of teaching assistance. Uh, and around that time, uh, spring uh, 2019, uh, we put out a call uh, for, for researchers and others to to submit um, abstracts uh, for, for papers for for the for the journal, um, and we had a, we had a great response, um, slightly above uh, average of, of what the journal expects for these kinds of things. We had nearly 50 expressions of interest, um, and it's really interesting to see the spread uh, geographically. So about 17 different countries. Um, represented uh, 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 and, and the country spread across five different continents. So a truly sort of global interest. Um, and it ended up, uh, we ended up selecting and uh, publishing seven um, articles on a range of topics and a, uh, an additional article which we asked uh, Michael to write um, as one of the originators of research uh, in the field of teaching assistants and paraprofessionals. We, uh, was certain that he would have interesting things to say, reflecting on uh, on the state of play uh, and, um, and bringing his worldly uh, experience and uh, and research background to to the proceedings. So we wanted to do that. It's worth just just saying that um, we were uh, um, invited um, to turn this special issue of uh, of the journal into a book, which should be coming out later this year, and we've been able to include. A couple of additional uh, papers in that in that extended form. So um, we'll let you know, Amy, when that's um, when that's coming. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, you know, we all know that what, all the work that we do, whether it's in the university or in a school, is always focused on on children. Um, and one of our children, um, who I'll, who I'll call Tom, this is not his real name. When he first joined us, Amy and I were looking outside my my office window, and there was a little boy at the age of um, seven or six who only wore his pyjamas all the time and uh, wore red wellingtons and would come to wouldn't want to come to school, but would um, would kind of shout his way to school and shout his way home from school. Um, and rather than it make the teaching assistant in our school, and rather than making him sit on the carpet and listen and be uh, what we'd see as typical, um, we allowed him to walk up and down the, 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 the classroom, chewing pencils and sitting under the table. Um, and it was because of the insight of really attending to the children in, in, in front of us uh, that um, that Amy, who was working with Tom, uh, realised that despite all those external behaviours, he was listening attentively and could answer all the questions if you just gave him some space. Um, so what comes out from a lot of the work that you've done is is how is stepping back as well as stepping in. 
Um, so one of the things that, that Michael has written about is the idea that we're in this kind of new post, hopefully post COVID experience that we're living um, and increasingly will live. We're at this crossroads, aren't we, of, of what, do, what do educators do differently? What do they need to do the same? And that also goes to uh, conversations about what teaching assistants do. However, typically ministers um, or departments, they see crossroads as T-junctions where you go left or right. Um, and I was interested and hopeful to hear about the, you know, that we need to carve out new routes and directions of travel. So Michael, over to you. Can you expand a little bit more about what you're thinking about these new routes and pathways for our teaching assistant community after the pandemic? Yes, thank you so much, James. Thank you all for having me join you today. and. Uh, Amy, I'm going to have to learn more about what that honor means. I'm sure it, I know it's important, so my congratulations as well, but I'm going to need a little bit of an explanation about what it is. As, as you know, we don't have a queen. Um, but uh, to get back to the actual point, for, uh, first, let me just say that uh, I see a very valued and important role for teaching assistants in inclusive schools. I think one of the things that I've um, encountered over time is that much of the work that I've done over the last 25 or 30 years with my team has been challenging the way that we currently operate, what we, what, what is the status quo in many American schools. And I think some people have um, incorrectly characterized that as somehow um, not being supportive of the role of teaching assistants in schools. And that could, there could be anything further from the truth. As a former special education teacher myself, uh, I worked with children who had very intensive and multiple um, disabilities as a special education teacher. I relied very heavily uh, on very skilled uh, and dedicated teaching assistants, which we call paraprofessionals in the United States in our in our regulations and laws. So um, I just want to say that I do see, first of all, an important role for them going forward. The question is really, do we use them wisely? And unfortunately, I would say here in the US, uh, historically, we have not used them wisely. And we have put the burden of the success of inclusive education on the backs of those paraprofessionals um, and others uh, have, in a sense, abdicated responsibility for um, carrying part of the load. And there's been too much of the load on the paraprofessionals. So the challenges that we face are not caused by paraprofessionals. And in, in my view, I, I don't think they're gonna be solved by uh, dealing directly just with paraprofessional issues. There's a big emphasis on we need to train them better, we need to supervise them better, we need to clarify their roles better. Those are all good things, um, and I support all of that. But if that's all we do, we run the risk of actually making things worse down the path that we've gone down, which is putting more and more. Now, now they're trained. Now we can ask them to do even more for um, less compensation. So. Um, we need to look at things more um, broadly. But Mike, can I add something that, that, that you know the word training is is used often for professionals and paraprofessionals. There's an initial teacher training, but you know we train people to you know you train dogs. We need to educate people to think like like Amy has spoken in the past. How do we educate our teaching assistant community so? And, and the teachers so that we think differently and we're, we're much more able to, re, to be able to respond to what's in front of us rather than, oh, I've got some training, I'm going to just uh, um, deliver the training directly to the autistic child or the child with Down syndrome. Right. So, so the, language, the language is problematic still, I think, uh, for yeah. paraprofessionals. Yes, you're right. And of course, the language is used different ways and in different locations and has different kind of... Uh, uh, context, uh, but I but I get your meaning, and I think one of the things that uh, we've found uh, here, uh, I alluded to it a moment ago. It's this concept of a training trap. Yeah. So again, I'm using that language, training trap, but yeah. it's the idea that we're providing a little bit of of education, and then we're expecting a lot more than the relative to the amount that we're offering. We also have a bit of um, what I call the the 
teacher assistant or paraprofessional conundrum, which is no matter what direction we go with this, there's a problem. Because for example, many, para, many teaching assistants feel disrespected if they're not engaged in instructional tasks, yet sometimes they're asked to engage in instructional tasks where they may not be fully prepared. Um, they're expected to function as a teacher when they don't have the background necessarily of a teacher. Some may, but it's not necessarily guaranteed. You know, I think one of the things that we can do, um, I took a few notes before our uh, call today, and I was thinking about the roles issue and how one of the things we need to think about differently is the sequence in which we make decisions about roles of teaching assistants. Historically, what we've done is we've, in here anyway, and I think uh, around the Western world particularly, we focused on paraprofessional roles because it's the easy thing to see, like, oh, we need to clarify their roles. Yes, good idea. The problem is we've done that in isolation, and what we really need to do is in terms of sequence is first we need to clarify what is the role of the classroom teacher in an inclusive school because they are a linchpin if you can have the best special educator you can have the best paraprofessional uh, teaching assistant but if your teacher is not engaged with the students with disabilities it all falls apart or it all goes sideways and so we need to look at the role of the teacher the role of um, how do you refer to your special educators? They're resource teachers or special education teachers. What's the language you use? We're learning coaches here. Learning coaches, okay. Yeah, but so, other schools are teaching assistants. Okay, so uh, you need to, uh, I would say you need to look at, uh, people need to look at the relationship between the role of the teacher, the classroom teacher, the learning coach, their collaboration with each other. And then once you've clarified that, then you're in a position to start looking at the roles of the teaching assistants so that they can support the role of the teacher and, um, and the learning coach. Because too often the focus is, you know, what is the role, what is the, 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 the TA is supporting the student. And I'm trying to get people to shift to think of the TA as supporting the teacher. So, um, I mean, I was interested to read that that aspect of supporting the teacher because we, we interestingly, we've we've gone the other way and said we need to we need to focus all everyone's focus needs to be on the on the child, um, and that in this in this country, I don't know if Rob agrees with this, but teacher assistants typically in the past were people who did sharpening the pencils and photocopied stuff for the teacher. They were like administrators for the teacher. That's not what you're suggesting, is it? No, um, it's being, it's, supp it, well, let me back up. It's not exclusively that. No. Can they help with non-instructional tasks? Uh, I think they can. One of the uh, real turning points for some of our schools was some research that we did. Um, this is going back 20 years now on teacher engagement. And what we observed in our schools was that people were so worried about um, how about disrespecting the, the, the uh, teaching assistants. So they were very concerned about that. They recognized that these were valued professionals that needed to be treated well. So what we had though in observation was we had a teaching assistant teaching a small group of learners that had um, extra instructional needs. Um, and the assistant was not necessarily skilled in that arena. And at the same exact time, the teacher who is skilled in that arena was at the photocopy machine making photocopies. And so it almost became backward. So one of the things we have to do is, is help people understand that non-instructional roles can be valued if they are part of a bigger scheme that allows the teacher to have access to actually teaching the student. And that when the paraprofessional or the TA is doing instructional work, that it is supplemental to what the teacher is doing. It's not replacing what the teacher is doing. So yeah, it's both. Yeah, it's, and this, the, the kind of the creating of this kind of puzzle of who does what, when and why, and, and starting from what does the senior leaders do in the school to what do the teachers do? What do the, the special educational needs coordinators do? 
What do the teaching assistants do? What do parents do as part of this mix of, of enabling children to be the very best they can be? Rob, you know, given the EEF's most recent findings about the impact of teaching assistants during the pandemic and uh, and the work that you've done, how do you see the role of teaching assistants moving forward? Um, I, I, I mean, based on the work that, that we've done, and I know you've, you've spoken to um, our excellent colleague, Paula, Paula Bosenkett, um, before as well. Um, based on the, the work that we've done and that the EEF evaluated, I think what we, what we now have grounds for is a, um, a a way of thinking about um, using teaching assistance to uh, support support learning al alongside what the teacher is doing. So Michael was talking about you know suppl uh, supplementing what the teacher is doing. So I think one expression of that, based on the work that we've done, is that TAs. But in a sense, what we've sort of been doing, and, and you can, I think you can lay the door, lay the blame at policymakers to uh, to a fair degree um, uh, for this, is that the the, the focus always seems to be relent relentlessly on what the teaching assistant should be doing um, in an instructional capacity to improve learning outcomes, and for, for all the reasons that we've explored, that's slightly um, slightly backward, given that you have the children with. The most um, you know, acute additional needs, complex needs, um, getting uh, uh, much needed individual uh, individual support, but from someone who is a non-teaching expert. And as, as Michael said, it's really, really we can't come kind of say this enough. It's just just sort of saying that is not to in any in any way sort of elevate teachers above TAs or to denigrate TAs. It's just to recognise that these are two different roles, um, or to suit. Or, so certainly from a training basis, you know, teachers are, you know, they, they go to their teacher training. So in, in a way, I think you have to you have to start from where teaching assistants are and you and you need to build on what it is they are potentially better positioned to be able to do. So given that they do spend a lot, of, a lot more time with um, uh, individual kids and, and small groups, um, uh, well, sometimes the teachers leaving the whole class, so they've got bit, they've got more of that sort of face time, quality time uh, with the children. What we've sort of worked towards is a way of best using that time um, to support um, support um, independence and children's problem solving um, capabilities alongside the delivery of the curriculum. So that's a that's a kind of subtle way of, of looking at it. So ra rather than the, the, the conversations always being around sort of instruction uh, and, and pedagogy and, and, and sort of loading the responsibility on, on TAs to get better learning outcomes from children, you know, quite often sort of struggling more than others, is to work with them to um, you know, get better at managing their own learning, at, at scaffolding their own learning, becoming more independent. And in a sense, it's 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 it, as you sort of build that up, build those stores up um, within children over time. If we're to see impact, in, you know, in 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 terms of learning, yeah. it's almost kind of driven by the children themselves because they are getting better at, at, at learning. And that I think, and that that sort of achieves two things. One, it sort of carves out a very a much needed role for teaching assistants that is a lot, it's harder for teachers to do because they can't be in two places at once, managing a room of maybe 30 children. And the other thing I think is really important is it gives us some kind of foundation for providing a professional identity to the teaching assistant. So quite often their, their role is a little bit ill-defined and it's a bit fuzzy, um, but if we can move towards something which says uh, you know, really capitalises on their uniqueness and their essentialness in classrooms. I think we can almost reframe the question about value. You know, we, 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 we as we've been saying, we implicitly you ask any head teacher, they will, they, 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 they will say how much they value their teaching assistant. Sure. Yeah. Um. And but this sort of gives a, a gives gives a bit more sort of definition when we sort of address the question. Well, what is it that they do? What is it that they do that yeah. sort of teachers can't do? And add real value to the classroom. And and you know, I think with with Paula in the previous video, we spoke about you know teaching assistants who are act who are like Velcro, they stuck to the child, and then the teaching assistants who 
are more like elastic bands. They they go out when needed and they go in when needed. And, and it's that it's that subtle and nuanced behavior, you know, awareness of the children that teaching assistants often have that the teachers they do have as well, but they they kind of focus on something different. And having that that kind of careful um, awareness, we've seen real value in, in that model. I think it comes from the work you've done, Robin, about you know Velcro and elastic bands. It's a nice way of 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 um, conceiving how they might uh, be in classrooms. We're also interested in this idea. Our, our teaching assistants, the scaffolders, they help. You know, they scaffold up and they scaffold children. To, as Paula's model also shows with yours. Um, so, you know, we in the in the in the UK we've had things like individual education plans, and we've had we have educational uh, individual behaviour plans and EHCPs, educational healthcare plans, um, but they all seem to focus on the, you know, the, the language of one-to-one. -one. You know, you're, you're entitled to one-to-one -one support, and what that means, parents think it's just there's an adult with them all day long. We don't do that here. Other schools don't do it in that same way. And given that we can't recruit people, having one-to-one -one is very, very difficult. What does that really mean? So I was really, um, I was really um, interested to, to read the idea of uh, that, that Michael, you, you mentioned about individual independence plan, which really focuses on everyone's attention and how do we help children become as independent as they possibly can be. Um, could you share a little bit more, explain a little bit more about, about that idea? Yes. Uh, so first, just to give you some context, here in the state of Vermont, which is one of the heaviest users of teacher assistance in schools to support students with disabilities in inclusion oriented schools, um, approximately half of all of the special education teaching assistants are assigned one to one to an individual student. So it's a very, very dominant model. Um, the independence plan is really rooted in data that uh, has identified a whole host of inadvertent detrimental effects associated with the excessive proximity of a teaching assistant to the student. And again, I want to point out something that, that Rob mentioned a minute ago. This is in no, this is no way of blaming the paraprofessional for this or blaming the TA for this situation. In fact, what we hear from a lot of the TAs in terms of that Velcro effect is that when they are assigned to an individual student, they're concerned that if they are not physically present, literally within arm's reach of the student at all times, that sometimes people, they're worried that people are thinking that they're not doing their job. Okay. So having that understanding of that rubber band elasticity effect that you uh, pointed out is, is really important so that um, whether it's the, the head teacher or the classroom teacher understands that uh, that it's appropriate to be backing off at different times. But you know, there's this host. Of, I won't list them all, but you know, examples of some of these inadvertent detrimental effects are that you know it interferes with uh, teacher engagement. It can interfere with peer interactions. Uh, it can uh, create isolation within the classroom. Students can become unnecessarily dependent. Some students are stigmatized by the uh, close presence of, of the uh, paraprofessional, especially as they get older. And, uh, you know, too often here anyways, they are assigned with good intention, uh, but then they just stay forever. Um, you know, it's like once they're there, they just stay forever. And the independence plan is based on the notion that, you know, even if you need feel like there's some very intensive need that you need to start with the one to one, that you're still going to be subject to these inadvertent detrimental effects and you should be looking at ways to fade that support. And it, let me also be clear, this is not a financial uh, issue in terms of wanting to fade to save money. Uh, this is about the student's best interest. And it usually um, these independence plans can be built on um, a combination of, of approaches. One uh, is something that, that Rob alluded to, which has to do with student skill development. Um, so them being able to communicate more effectively, behave in more pro-social ways, uh, have ways to cope with things, but also it has to do with um, raising and changing expectations and attitudes, and also exploring other natural supports like peers and the classroom teacher. 
Uh, the point of the independence plan also is to get the team together who's who are working with the child so that this work is done very consciously and purposely um, and involves the family and as much as possible involves a student because just like you you told your story about Thomas um, you know we have collected many stories from students who who basically have not been listened to um, and they've told us like I don't like somebody like right on me all the time. And uh, and sometimes they've been able to say that with their words. And sometimes if they don't have verbal language or a clear augmentative system, sometimes they're telling us through their behavior that they find this intrusive. Uh, not all students, but uh, but some do. And so we need to be uh, we need to be thinking about that. So I also want to point out that when we're talking about independence plans, or sometimes people call them fading plans, it never ever should be about taking away support. It's always about providing a different support, doing things in a different way. Because some people talk about, oh, should we just like cut our one-to-one -one supports or should we just cut uh, um, paraprofessional services? And it's like, no, <laughs> no, never, don't do that unless you are in a position to put something better in place. What's interesting is that more is not necessarily better. And we've been stuck in this more is better mentality and we're trying to break free of that. So sometimes the more natural supports can actually be better, but again, consciously, purposely um, approached. Fantastic. I mean, you, you've given us all um, a lot of um, ideas and food for thought about how we, how we evolve the work we do in schools, um, not only to create inclusive communities, through the the different professionals who work within these communities, um, for P, we um, I just Tom's got a, I wrote Tom a, Tom a letter over here. Um, I thought, there it is here. Um, I'll read it in a minute. But um, for people like me, for senior, if there's any senior teachers or head teachers who will be watching this, what one piece of advice? What one thing could we just start now that would carve a new not not a not a new T-junction, but actually not even a path that's there. How would, one thing that we could start carving a new route through the, the educational landscape about teaching assistants. Uh, Rob. Um, thanks, James. I, I think I, I think the, one, the, the starting point is it's got, it's got to be an understanding of the situation in your own school and maybe um, opening your 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 eyes kind of to what's happening in the classrooms to just see the the extent to which some of these things we've been talking about may or may not be present and the 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 impacts of these things and senior leaders can be forgiven for for not being aware of what's happening in every single you know classroom all the time given that everything they've got to be carrying on with so but if they can carve out a bit of space for you know a, a quite a useful exercise for this would be as a as a leader to shadow or to follow a child who has quite a, quite a lot of TA support. So a child with a with a you know education health and care plan, for example, who's assigned one-to-one -one support, to just observe the day or a good part of the day through through their eyes. You know, look at what happens when the teacher is leading the class and what the, the TA is doing. What is it they're doing that's useful? What is it that might just be unintentionally getting in the way? Because, for example, as Michael was saying, there is a there is a an understandable need that teaching assistants might have to appear useful. Now that's going to be you've got to be really mindful of that if you're the head teacher sat in the classroom because you might be just making that situation a bit more you know, amplified than it normally would be. But the the point is to sort of see it through the child's eyes and then to see what what you might usefully change. And I think part of that has to be um, getting teaching assistants comfortable with the idea that actually sitting there with a child and not doing anything with them actually might be the right thing to do um, in the moment. You know, so sort of cutting in and, and giving the child the answer yeah. might, might, sort of, might seem like the right thing to do. So it's getting, it's, I, I suppose to, sort of to, 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 to cut to the quick and summarise it, it is to observe and ask questions about, about what you're seeing in the day-to-day -day practice and, and think about what does that mean for participation, inclusiveness, uh, opportunity and so on. Fantastic. 
And and Michael, what one piece of advice we could action? I think uh, piggybacking on what Rob said, uh, but taking it to a broader level, I think school self-assessment, self-examination uh, is really important because so often we're looking at the child, understandably, but we're looking at the child and saying, you know, like, what are their needs? What are their challenges? Uh, how can we support that? And we're not looking at what are the practices in the classroom that lead to their being uh, excluded, sitting back in the back of the classroom, working separately with the TA when the rest of the class is doing some other activity uh, because we haven't planned uh, for curricular inclusion. Um, and so, uh, and, and also our attitudes. I think I alluded to this earlier. I think teacher engagement is maybe the single most important factor in whether uh, an inclusive classroom is successful for a student with a disability. Um, it, it sends just a huge message to the rest of the students. If the regular classroom teacher is actually engaged as the teacher, not just as a host. And I think the one, in addition to just um, overall self-examination and looking at service delivery models, which is beyond the scope of what we have time to talk about today, I think that there's one, um, kind of foundational question that we can ask as we make those observations that Rob was referring to. And the question is, would it be okay if the student didn't have a disability? So we're observing, for example, uh, a paraprofessional or TA who's been asked to support a student in math. And this uh, person does not have a strong background in math. Would that be okay if the student didn't have a disability? Or we find that in, a, in doing that follow up with the student that they're getting 50% or 70% of their instruction from the TA and, and almost none from the teacher. Would that be okay if the student didn't have a disability? So I think it's a general question that we can ask to help us self assess. And you know what, both of you are talking about one thing that, that I would like to just end uh, end the conversation today. It's Tom taught me more than I could possibly uh, have imagined. I wrote to him and said, Dear Tom, you're the one of the most delightful young men I've ever met. You explained to me how the world could be better, could, could better work because you think adults should teach the children how to be responsible and independent. So everything we've spoken about is a, a child who has autism who's saying, because we just need to teach everyone to be more responsible and independent, that'll be fine. Um, and that's what we'll try to do um, and share your your kind of your ideas uh, with our with our network hub. Thank you very much for your support um, and uh, all the very best. Thank you.